I would like to read all of 51 and 52, but can't. Got to preach. So I'll skip a little bit and read verse 11 in Isaiah 51. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Awake, 17th verse. Awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hath drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There's none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that brought up. Skipping to the 52nd chapter, and we'll begin with the first verse. Awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for hence Forth there shall no more come in to thee the uncircumcised, the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust and arise. Sit down, O Jerusalem, and loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Seventh verse, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace and bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, that together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Praise God. Eleventh verse, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, Touch no unclean thing in the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste nor by flight. For the Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel shall be your rearward. Amen. In uh, Hebrews chapter 13, excuse me, 12 and verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling, the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Amen. Ah, oh, come ye out of her, he said. In chapter 52 of Isaiah, praise God. Come ye, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from them. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Praise God. God is leading his people out. I said, God is leading his people out. Isaiah chapter 51 and 52 is the story of the captivities of God's people, past, present, and future. It is the story of their sufferings for their sins. It is the story of their languishing in all of their captivities. It is the story of the captivity of Egyptian bondage is the story of the captivity of the bondage of Babylon, is the story of the present dispersion of Israel. But even more than that, there is even a higher meaning to the text, and that is, it is the story of the children of God bound by this earth, bound for the moment to this world, bound and limited for the moment by worldly things, bound and hindered and hampered for the moment by earthly limitations. Yes, we are. And so today, we're not in Egyptian bondage, but we're in captivity. We're not in Babylon, but we're still in captivity. 
Amen. We're not captivated and led forth in chains by the Assyrian as he talked about in the 51st and 52nd chapter of Isaiah. But we find ourselves still in a, in a figure in bondage. Amen. We cry today, O oh Lord, thy people have got cancer. We cry today, O oh Lord, thy people have got heart trouble. We cry today, O oh Lord, thy people have been chased from their homes in the mountains to the ghettos and the cities to make a living. And they've been bound down for years in the asphalt jungle because that's the only way they could live. And they have to live every day driving back and forth, back and forth, fighting the traffic, amen, to the sins inferno of the modern industry where women work beside the men and they live in sin and rebellion against God. Amen. Yes, we're in captivity today in a figure. Thy people are oppressed. They bear pain. They are afflicted by inflation. They are oppressed by economic conditions that hold them down and keep them praying and keep them weeping and keep them crying. Sometimes they don't know which way to go. Sometimes they don't know which way to turn. Sometimes death comes and stares them in the face. And oh God, they're brought to the stark realities of eternity. Yes, we live in a land where death seems to prevail, where a very real thing in life is the funeral home and the casket and funeral arrangements. We need somebody to lead us out, and God is going to lead his people out of these lowlands. He's going to lead all of his saints out of the old folks' home. Their brain might have deteriorated, and their mind for the moment might be gone. But some of these days, the spiritual man is going to be set free from this flesh that holds it down. And the doors of clay will burst asunder. The chains will fall off. And the captive soul will be made free. Hallelujah! The captivities, the captivities of God's people, past and present and future. Praise God. He talks about the redeemed of the Lord returning to Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Praise God. Just like Abraham, God has set you a goal tonight. Amen. He has set you a goal, and that goal is Zion. That's what Abraham saw when he saw that city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. That's what he saw. He saw Zion. He saw that heavenly city. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews declares that he looked for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. Why? Because he saw it one time. He called a vision on it one time. God set him a goal one time. He got up and he left Ur of the Chaldees. He sold out. He sold his modern home. He gave up his modern comfortable life. He bought him a Bedouin's tent and struck out across no man's land to a land flowing with milk and honey looking for that city that God had given him a vision of that he never forgot, that he never lost the faith of, he never lost the hope of. Whatever it was that Abraham saw, it was good enough to leave everything behind to get. Whatever it was that Abraham saw, it was good enough to leave the most modern city in the world. They had running water in their houses at Ur of the Chaldees. Amen. 
Those guys that dig in the ruins of past generations, the archaeologists, I think they call them, they found out that they had water even piped into their houses, and they had even bathtubs in their homes and Ur of the counties. Hallelujah. But Abraham, he was something else. I want you to know that Sarah was something else. Bless your heart. Hallelujah. She didn't drag her lip and drag her feet when Abraham said, I've seen this city, and we're going to leave this one and go after it. Praise God. Sarah was to leave her home, her comfortable way of life, and take up an abode in a veteran's tent. And forevermore, she would be called a wanderer and a vagabond in the earth. Hallelujah. But they caught wind of a city. They caught visions of a heavenly sign. And they left everything to get it better. And if we're going to follow Abraham, sooner or later we're going to have to decide this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from the heavens open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Praise God. Now tonight is never more real than it is tonight to the true children of God. They know their Lord's going to lead them out. They know their Lord's going to lead them out. They're going to pray and do the best they can. But they know their Lord's going to lead them out of this pilgrim land. If we're not careful tonight, we'll forget that we're strangers. If we're not careful tonight, we'll forget that we're pilgrims. If we're not careful tonight, we'll forget that we're aliens. And I declare to you that all those that forget, they're not going to go. All those that fall in love with this present world, they're not going to go. Praise God. If you love this present world, you, like Demas, will depart from the call of God. If you love this present world, you, like Demas, will vacillate and oscillate and then apostatize and go back to Thessalonica having loved this present world. If you love this present world, you'll backslide. If you love this present world, you won't keep on keeping on for God. But if you call a vision for heaven, amen, you'll wear this world like a loose garment. And you'll hear the call of God. Depart ye, depart ye. Go out from the midst of her and be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord my my God, my God, it, it pictures the children of God departing from Babylonian captivity and those same golden vessels that Belshazzar had had them to bring out and drink to the gods of gold and silver and wood and stone and saw that handwriting on the wall. Amen. But in another generation, in just a few short years, Cyrus would arise right on time, according to prophecy. Praise God. And the children of God would arise at the command of the Lord. And they'd go home. And what's God saying? You're going back to Jerusalem. You're going back to the house of God. You're going to rebuild the temple and be clean. And that bear the vessels of the Lord. Don't touch the unclean thing. But take those vessels and bear them to the house of God. Go ye out from the midst of her. Amen. Tonight, the allegory reigns true. Hallelujah. You are the vessels of the Lord. You are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Not only are you the vessels of the Lord, and not only are you the temple of God, and you're not your own, but you're bought with a price. Praise God. But you're also the priest of your own temple. You're also the servant of the Lord. And as you bear this sacred vessel, as you bear this sacred thing that we call the temple of God, as you bear your own private ark to yonder Zion, the Bible admonishes us to be clean, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. Some say, Brother Collins, I don't think I want to go. I think I'll just camp here. 
I think I'll just enjoy the scenery a while. I think I'll just be satisfied with this old world. It's good enough for me. But some, they're going to depart. Some are going to give it a permanent wave. <laughs> Goodbye, old world. I'm through with you. Goodbye, old world. I'm through with you. Tonight, say goodbye, old world. I'm through with you. Because those are the people that's going to Zion. The old song says we're marching to Zion. We're marching to Zion. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. I want you to know we're something. I want you to know we're somebody. I want you to know that we're going someplace. Praise God. We cry today, oh God, if we only had a leader. The quest for the children of Israel was give us a leader. Give us the deliverer. The cry of the children of God down through the ages was give us a deliverer. Every time they sinned, God took away their deliverer. When they repented, God gave them another, another deliverer. Amen. They'd have 20 years of victory, 40 years of victory, and then they would have 20 years of captivity and 20 years of death and 20 years of suffering. And sometimes it lasted as long as 70 years. In Egyptian bondage, it lasted over 200 years. God's people have always been in trouble in this world. And about the time you get ready to feel at home, brother, it's going to break loose all over again. And you're going to look and you're going to long for a deliverer. Oh, God, we need a deliverer today. We need a new leader today. Praise God. Your people are sick. We need a healer. Your people are in trouble. We need a deliverer. The devil's giving them a hard time. We need a brand new judge to arise. He need another little David with his slang shot. He need another Shamgar with his ox goat. He need another Gideon with his 300 laps and his 300 pictures and a few other odds and ends. God, give us another deliverer. And God has always come on the scene just in time to give people to deliver. God has always come on the scene just in time to give a church a victim of its own apostasy, a victim of its own backsliding, a victim of its own worldliness and neglect, to give the church a new revival. God has always sent them a leader. But it seems like we just about run out of captains. We just about run out of generals. And let me ask you a question tonight. If we had a general, would we have any army that would take his orders? We live in a day when people don't want government. We live in a day when nobody wants to be told what to do. They want to be told that you're all right. You're doing everything right. And nothing's wrong. Amen. They want a leader that finds out which way they're going and then tells them to do it. They're like the old stubborn, balky horse that a man bought. And they, nobody could get anything out of him, and a man bought him. And, and finally one day after some time, he was getting some work out of the old horse. He said, how in the world did you do it? He said, well, he said, I found out what the horse wanted to do, and I told him to do that. And I told him to do that so many times that he, I want his confidence. And then when I told him to work, <laughs> he went to work. Praise God. But we ain't got time to mess around. We've not got time to dilly-dally around. Do you want to spend your life a balky horse? you want to spend your life a soldier AWOL? Away without leave? 
You want to spend your life living halfway for God and halfway for the world, halfway for the devil? Amen? No, we don't want that. God, we need a leader. A unique kind of a leader today. Somebody that can do the job. First off, before God has ever honored the people and sent them that kind of leadership, they had to begin to repent. They had to begin to repent of their sins. They had to repent of their wicked ways. When Daniel fell on his face and personified Israel and led the way for Israel to repent of their sins, God sent them Nehemiah. God sent them Ezra. God sent them Jerubbabel. Amen. And Jeshua, the son of Josedek. Praise God. When they repented of their sins, God sent them Haggai and Zechariah. When they repented of their sins, God sent them leaders. Amen. You see, if God sends the generals before the army is ready to obey, they still won't accomplish much. Why, if he sends them Samson with Israel still in bad shape, when Samson climbs up on top of the mountain and sees what's going to happen with the Philistine, it's the Israelites that come after Samson. They bind him themselves. Or, excuse me, they attempt to bind him themselves. Samson said, I'll go with you. But just promise me this one thing, that you won't bind me yourselves and fall on me yourselves. Why are they going after Samson in the first place? They ought to have been up there with Samson. They ought to have been with their captain. They ought to have been with their general and judge. But here the people of God are in such bad shape. They're rejecting the leader that God sent among them. Amen. Oh, but you say, he's done so many things. He hasn't behaved himself altogether like a, uh, a, a Nazarite ought to behave himself. Amen. That's true. But you ought to have seen the rest of them. Praise God. You see, Samson was so much better than the rest of the people that he judged that he looked like an angel up to side of the rest of them. Praise God. And too many times today, we want a preacher, if you please. We want a leader, if you please. That's a product of their times. And too many times, those leaders that are proclaimed greatest in their day are merely products of the times. The people loved them like the false prophets. They had lots of good things to say about them like they do the false prophets. But all the literature you read is not necessarily written by holy men like the Bible was. Amen. Praise God. And a lot of the men that rose up in bygone years and have gone down in the annals of church history as great orators of the past had their skeletons in the closet. Some of them were not even in the closet. Amen. Spurgeon smoked his black cigars and said, I'm smoking these cigars for the glory of Christ. Amen. Phillips Brooks smoked his pipe and his cigars. Amen. Why, that great publisher and writer sat in his room publishing his religious magazine and right widely proclaimed leader and religious writer, amen, with pipes all over the place and a room full of smoke and declared that the devil invented fresh air. And so all of the leaders of bygone years, amen, they were not what they proclaimed to be by those that came after them. All the leaders of bygone years, amen, they had clay feet for the most part. But there were a few men that rose up that were not a product of their times. They were called of God. There were a few people that rose up, bless your heart, amen, that were holy men. There were a few people like John Wesley that had a heartwarming on Aldersgate Street, amen, and arose to preach the
the gospel, hated and despised by the church, hated and despised by the people, but brought revival, praise God. There's a few people like Charles Grandison Finney, amen, a converted lawyer, congregational and Presbyterian preacher, who after he got gloriously saved, argued with his pastor about the fallacy of unconditional election. Charles G. Finney was a lawyer, and he said it won't stand up in court. That man prayed through in a patch of woods, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he said, I literally bellowed out the unutterable gushings of my soul. Amen. Everything went. The sin business was over when Charles Oh, gee, Finney came into town. Now, one more time. Modern Pentecostalism is filled with cheap ministries today that don't separate from the world nor advocate separation from the world. They're telling people the news they want to hear. One more time. We need leaders to rise up like John and Charles Wesley. We need men to rise up like Charles G. Finney. We need men to fight sin and booze and drugs and crime like Billy Sunday. Praise God. We need men, though, with a double portion of the power of God. But the plaintive wail of the children of God in captivity was, there's none to guide her among all the sons whom she has brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she has brought up. Will there be no little boys and girls arise from highway of wholeness to lead God's people on a little further? Will there be no sons and daughters arise from our Pentecostal ranks today to lead the people out instead of in. You see, God is still leading his people out. God is still crying, Depart ye in the 52nd chapter. Depart ye. Go out from thence. That means this place you're in now. This world you're in now. This situation we find ourselves in now. This captivity we find ourselves in now. I don't think it's so bad. You will. When you rock from side to side on a hospital bed. And there's no relief for pain. And the only way you can find any peace is from the knock you out with drugs. You will, it's like Brother Flatter just a few months ago, sat vigilantly and diligently by the bedside of his angel wife. Amen. As she departed this world. It won't be long, neighbor. You may think it's all fun and games tonight, but tomorrow it'll be a crash on the highway. Tomorrow, it'll be the unexpected thing. And you'll know that we're earthbound. You'll understand that we're in a corruptible body. You'll understand that we're still, as it were, in captivity. We're still in chains today. Amen. Tomorrow, little mama, what are you going to do when you see that precious little angel that you cradle in your arms tonight? And that you're taking pictures of tonight, looking out from behind bars for pushing drugs. What are you going to do then? You're going to realize, amen, that we're earthbound and sin prevails and the devil has slain. What are you going to do, rebellious mom and dad that wants your kids to enjoy more than you enjoy to this world? And you're not too much for this holiness jump. You're not too much on this holiness kick. What are you going to do tomorrow when your son comes home? His hair hanging down his back. And he brings his girlfriend. He says, Mama, we're going to live together a while. And we're going to try it out. And if it works, 
then we're going to get married. What are you going to do, Mama, then? Amen. I'll tell you what you're going to do. Yeah, you might have been ever so hard, but you're going to grieve. And you're going to pine. Amen. You're either going to grieve and pine or you're going to justify it one or the other and go with it. Amen. That's right. Yes, neighbor. We're still living in a land of sin. We're still dwelling in these lowlands, if it were, where sin and death abound. Amen. Tell me, tell me, tell me. So satisfied in this world and so much fun going on. What you going to do tomorrow when your mind is gone? Your nerves are wrecked and you can't get enough whiskey and you can't get enough drugs to satisfy the craving. The nervous system is broken down and with all the drugs and alcohol you can get, you're still cold turkey and your life is ebbing out into eternity. You take an overdose and you end it all. Amen. We're living in a dark old world, folks. We're living in a dark world. Don't you get too satisfied here. You're going to be disappointed. Don't you get too settled here. You're going to be disappointed. Don't become too involved with the affairs of this life. You're going to be shamed again and again and shamed again and again by the affairs of this life. But there's some children of God that realize that God is calling us out. We didn't come here to stay anyway. We, we just come to sojourn. We're just passing through on the way home. Amen. And there's some folks, praise God, that have found the leader, if you please. And they found him in Isaiah chapter 52. Praise God. He said, you shall not go out by flight. You shall not go out with haste. For well, the Lord will go before you. Praise God. The brother comes. I had the Lord all along. I thought I did. But the devil slipped up on my blind side. But in the Lord, we've got something more than a leader. He said, the Lord shall go before you. And the God of Israel shall be your rearward. Praise God. I'll tell you something. With Jesus going before us. And with the Holy Ghost covering over us like those doves. That Brother Hype was talking about. Amen. And the God of heaven bringing up the rear. You're going to make it, brother. We found the leader. We found that our heroes had clay feet. Amen. We found that the preachers and the deacons needed a leader too. Amen. We found that all the heroes, they needed a leader. And in themselves alone was not the answer. But the answer was in Jesus. We found a leader. And praise God. The Lord promises the church along with Israel that we've found a destination tonight. Praise God, we got the Lord leading us. He's leading us out. Oh, God, that, that distresses some folks because having faith to go out is a hard thing for most people. They'd rather stay right where they are, where it's comfortable. But the Lord is leading us out. Now, where is He leading us? Praise God. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us a story. But ye are come unto Mount Zion unto the city of the living God, unto the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn brother. There had never been a time in all the history of the church where it had a general assembly. There has never been a time in all the history of the church where all the church got together at one time. But there's going to be a time in the very near future when the Lord leads us to that city of Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable company of angels, that all the church, everyone, the names will be called, the roll will be read, and there'll be a general assembly of the church of the firstborn. Amen, which are written in heaven. And we're going to God, the judge of all, and the spirits 
of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, yes, we are. We've got to take it by faith tonight. We've got to accept our Holy Spirit guide tonight. We've got to accept his proxy manifestation of Jesus Christ in our lives tonight. But some of these days, we will cease to walk by faith. When it comes to seeing Jesus, we'll walk by sight. He said, you're come to the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hallelujah. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hallelujah. I know my Lord going to lead me out. I know my Lord's going to lead me out. I'm going to pray, do the best I can. And I know my Lord's going to lead me out of this pilgrim land. Praise God. Pretty soon the captivity will be over. Pretty soon the sorrow will be past. Pretty soon you'll have a body that won't get tired anymore. Pretty soon you'll have a body that's not afflicted by rheumatism and arthritis anymore. Pretty soon you'll have a body where the eyes don't grow dim and the ears don't grow deaf. Pretty soon you'll have a body that the feet don't get tired. Pretty soon with that body sanctified, cleansed, washed in the blood of the Lamb, made perfect, we'll have that general assembly of the church of the living God in the presence of the Lord. Would you like to go tonight? Would you like to go? Oh, would you like to go? Amen. One of the crowning events in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas, was the annual Soldiers and Sailors reunion on the banks of Mammoth Spring. As just a little kid, I remember going to the reunion in Grandpa's iron-powered wagon. I remember in the distance they had a hot air balloon and a man was going to go up in a balloon and I remember that Grandpa pointed it out. We was late for the event. But he pointed out the balloon way yonder in the distance. Uh -huh. What a celebration that was to poor folks. I can still smell the watermelon in the stands along the side of the road. <laughs> Amen. I can still taste the, the lemonade and the ice cream cone. The old soldiers and sailors annual reunion. I remember one year, late, we, had a, we started school early in country school, late in the summer. Uh, August, we started school one month early, so we'd turn them out one month and let all country folks go to the bottoms and pick cotton. And, and uh, those poor folks in the country, they'd get on a truck and haul a batching outfit down to the uh, Mississippi River bottoms and Black River bottoms down in northeast Arkansas and southeast Missouri, and... Uh, uh, they, they, they'd live in an old house, an old uh, tenement house or an old shack or something, and, and batch around and pick cotton for a month, make enough money to get through the winter. We was in August school session, and it was time for the reunion, and Dorothy Shaver, she was going to get to go. So she had requested the teacher that she get to eat her dinner early, because someone was going to come by and pick up Dorothy Shaver and take her to the reunion. And I'll never forget, it was kind of a sad feeling that time of the year to see Dorothy getting to go. Dorothy was eating her dinner early. Dorothy was preparing for somebody to pick her up and take her to the reunion that all the rest of us had to stay. We didn't get to go. Amen. Some of these days, folks, you've never been to heaven. And you can't tell the story, so you've got to take this by faith. 
but there's going to be a reunion on the other side. And all of God's old soldiers, hallelujah, amen, roll up their sleeves and show the scars of me in battle, amen. I can almost smell the water on the river of life. I can almost smell the blooms on the tree of life. I can almost see the lights and the glitter. I can almost see the glamour as the children of God put on their new clothes. Some of us got to have our feast a little early. And the Lord came along and picked us up and took us to that reunion in heaven. And it looked like the rest of us had to stay behind. But I'll tell you tonight, if you'll get ready, if you'll get ready, you can go to the reunion tonight. If you'll get ready, you can go to the assembly, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You never tasted anything like you're going to taste at that feast. You never ate any food like you're going to eat at that feast. Fourth of July was special back home. We go to grandma's house sometimes. And I remember as a child, the first time I ever drank any lemonade, it was at grandma's house. I run in the house and I grabbed the dipper that was sticking down in this big bucket and dipped it down and took a big old swig. And man, I never tasted anything that tasted so good in all of my life. You know, I lost interest in playing, and I made regular trips all day long to the lemonade bucket. <laughs> it was a special time. Amen. We ate a lot of cornbread and a lot of biscuits. That's a luxury today. But we never did have light bread. Just a rare special occasion where we had light bread. And, oh, that was the best tasting if the Lord had anything better, he kept it to himself, I figured. And uh, at Grandma's house, one fourth of July, we had light bread. And I remember I got to eating that stuff. It tasted so good. And finally the call was made to make all the family picture. There was all the kids, all the generation, and all the grandkids. And standing right on the front row, scared to death. Amen, and he was going to have to be departed from his beloved light bread too soon was little Junior Collins with a hole in a piece, two pieces of light bread and his hand stuck through the hole on each side and he's hanging on to his light bread for dear life while the family pictures was being taken. <laughs> but you haven't tasted any light bread until you taste that manna that the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Revelation called it the hidden manna. God didn't, didn't even let the Israelites taste of it. Praise God. God didn't even let the children of Israel have a bite of this. He's had it hid for ages and ages. He's had it hid. Nobody's got to eat it. Nobody's got to taste it. Amen. He's the only one that's got the recipe, brother. Praise God. And if you be faithful to God some of these days, you're going to dip your dipper in God's bucket. Amen. And you're going to get to sit down at the table of the Lord and eat the hidden manna with a glorified body that you don't have to worry about cholesterol or calories <laughs> or salt or sugar. Everything's going to be just right. Tell me tonight. How are you going to feel when you're left behind? How are you going to feel when you refuse to separate yourself unto God in this world and depart out of her? Touch not the unclean thing, and be ye clean, ye that bow the vessels of the Lord. How is it going to make you feel when everybody else gets to go? And you're left behind. To be left behind, you have to refuse the leadership of the leader the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the leadership of the servants of God, God is sent. 
But the Lord, if you'll let him, he'll lead you out. Will you take his hand tonight as we come and say, Father, bless this message. Help us, Lord, to leave the things of the world behind that dull our vision and keep us, Lord, from enjoying the wonderful things of heaven. Oh, God, help us, Lord Jesus, to be faithful to God. Help us, Lord, to accept God's divine leadership and those that are besieged and beleaguered and tired and weary by the besetting things of this world. Help them to take courage and to be comforted and know that the Lord has called us out and that we're all going to have to leave anyhow. And so what does it matter? Thank you, Jesus. Save that soul tonight that's about to be left behind. Bring back that backslider that's about to trade his soul for mess this world's pottage. Lord, bring him back. We ask in Jesus' name. Stand with us. As we stand, we invite you to Jesus. Where will you be? Come on. A million years from now.